Welcome. Thank you very much for coming to our session here. We really enjoyed being at the conference this weekend. It's, I think, a different circle than we normally run in, so it's been interesting to meet all of you. And uh, you know, we appreciate all the interest that you showed us while we were here. So thank you. Um, so we like an interactive audience. We're actually fine with it being a smaller group here, kind of more intimate. We're very uh, conversational. Uh, if you guys have been hanging out with us in the seat swap room, <laughs> I think you probably picked up on that already. So yeah, just, you know, we are more than happy to follow where you guys want to lead us. Like, and you know, we tend to go down rabbit holes, so we have Chris to keep us in check. Um, that, not me, that <laughs> this, one. This Chris. Um, <laughs> We're, we're, the three of us know each other anyway, and we're, we're um, yeah, <laughs> famous for rabbit hole kind of things. Uh, so try and keep us online, but we're willing to discuss any interest, you know, any topics that interest all of you. So, um, you know, I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Oh, I actually introduced myself. So anyway, uh, let's back up a bit. Um, yeah, Lisa Bloodnick from Bloodnick Family Farm. I'm upstate New York. I've been. Uh, growing professionally for almost three decades. Uh, we started a farm right out of college. Um, we we're basically self-taught. My husband studied philosophy. Um, so now he stands out in the field philosophizing all day. Uh, um, it's a good use. <laughs> um, and my degree is environmental studies. But and uh, you know, ecology was my focus. Um, and so we've been market gardeners. We, you know, this is what we do for a living. Um, and somewhere along the way, I remember, like years ago, I don't remember when it was, but somebody asked me, oh, are you a seed saver? And I was like, no. <laughs> um, you know, because it, it's like a whole separate art and space requirements unto of itself, basically. Um, and I had three little kids, no time. But we always did save our own garlic. Uh, we have a strain of garlic that we've been saving for since the beginning, which is, like I said, almost 30 years now. Um, so, you know, and I think, you know, back in the early days, we grew a few dry beans, and we'd save the seeds from that, but I didn't consider myself a seed saver, per se. Um, and so my path has been kind of convoluted. We focused on income-producing market gardening. Um, and then, but at the same time, so I was interested in biodiversity, you know, because I studied ecology, and I always had an interest in that. And uh, so I got interested in the, the, the problems faced with like the loss of how, the genetic diversity we're losing. I think we only, we've already lost like 94% of our food crops, you know, variety wise. And um, yeah, just that stunning numbers, things like that. So started off with an awareness of the environmental and ecological ramifications. Um, and then the political thing kind of set in with you know, Monsanto and, you know, you know, agribusiness, big corporate, you know, multinational corporations buying up seed companies, which we can address. Um, so I got interested in the politics, you know, GMOs, um, you know, the, th the plain old assault on um, life. Um, and then, um, you know, you can only be angry for so long. It's exhausting. <laughs> um, you know, so, and then I started a couple of years ago, I, I got hooked into a few um, seed banks and individuals who started sending me seeds to grow out. The online social media has major downfalls and pitfalls, but it also can serve as a networking opportunity for like-minded people. And uh, there is very active seed community out there and, you know, it, you know, also since somebody knows that you're an experienced grower, that you you know, know how to do your stuff, you start being sent seeds, you know, for safety, safekeeping, grow outs, things like that. So my interest came grow outs, which was in line with the biodiversity, perverse, preserving diversity. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I started studying um, Rowan White, who's a Mohawk woman, who uh, runs a Seed Siva mentorship circle, um, an online seed saving course. Um, so I actually took two sessions with her and kind of full circle down to, well, got more involved in, um, you know, she has almost like a spiritual aspect to it and a, uh, you know, a responsibility, you know, that, so I've kind of, you know, there's an evolution to my seed saving as well. Um, so I think that was like our beginning was how did, you know, how did we get into it? Uh, so now people, 
like Nate <laughs> send me seeds and Chris sends me seeds, but also online people. Um, and I have, you know, probably several thousand. I probably have, I'm getting up close to a thousand just beans alone, but I also save, everyone calls me the bean lady, but I also save other stuff too. I brought, we're, we're talking about corns and some sunflowers and other things, sorghum, things like that. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna pass it off to Chris. Hello. Um, I'm Chris Hubbard. Most of you already have met me. Um, I'm a seed saver, seed uh, archivist, I guess. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I've got a doctorate in cultural anthropology, a doctorate in ethnobotany, um, other small degrees of such. Um, I'm a licensed uh, clinical herbalist. I treat out of a clinic in Knox County, Kentucky. Um, our community is old timey, so I, I make house calls. Sometimes we just just trade instead of uh, instead of uh, charging, you know, because they're in the mountains in Appalachia. There's a lot of poverty, a lot of problems. So, um, so to the seeds, uh, I guess I, I started before I was even born. My, um, my father and his father were seed keepers. Um, so I inherited seed. Um, and then I was traditionally trained um, through my nation, which is Jalagi, it means Cherokee. Uh, I'm from the Eastern Band in Western North Carolina. Um, and I was trained under Walker Calhoun. Um, probably never heard his name, but uh, he's uh, responsible for saving dance, music, uh, carving, healing, every, every um, art, art and craft of the Cherokee Nation, the, the traditional way. Um, he, he was a healer and then I was one that inherited uh, some of his, his work as a healer so um, I also inherited seeds from him um, my grandfather used to always carry seeds in his pocket and later I, I think a lot of it he would he would give me seeds uh, sometimes they would be uh, <laughs> uh, chestnuts just different things they're always good luck in Appalachia always supposed to have a buckeye or chestnut in your pocket oh, yeah. and uh, I didn't know that oh yeah and uh, just little sunflower seeds things and they were snacks you know and then then it was teaching about planting them and um, he had a large um, just a large uh, set of greenhouses it used to be some of the largest in southeast Kentucky and um, so I grew up grafting and learning all the bot botanical skills from him. Um, so the seeds started there and I just traveled, kept traveling. Uh, I was a men's traditional dancer, uh, believe it or not. Uh, going powwow circuits um, and I met a lot of native people a lot of indigenous people um, from all across the United States and they've welcomed me into their nations a lot of families have um, sometimes people just call me up saying I heard you save beans and they tell me that they have this bean that is this is the last of its kind and the family's no longer there and you know they they were the neighbor of someone who has thrown all their stuff out they had no family so and then all of a sudden I get this little bitty envelope with this little seed in it and grow it and it's it's this new bean that I have never seen before and it's just amazing to find such diversity in something that we eat almost every day in some way or form or fashion. I mean, we are so used to beans and corn and squash, tomatoes, 
peppers in our diet, when I talk about stuff, people don't realize the colors and the diversity of these, of uh, the vegetables and fruits of the earth. They don't really understand uh, the diversity of heirlooms that we that we collect. Um, I've been blessed um, in collecting. Uh, right now, uh, we've got over 4,000 varieties of just corn. Um, I can't tell you how many beans. They're in the thousands. I don't know how many. Um, tomatoes, same way. Um, so we're trying to um, get them grown and get them out to people. Uh, I started a rematriation project with uh, indigenous seeds that um, I've been saving for a long time. And um, some of these seeds, uh, literally there, there are four to five seeds left on the planet. That's it. Families have passed and some of these have not been grown by their original nations in 200 years. And you know they're they're older, and you don't know if they're if they'll germinate or or what. So it's a it's kind of a scary process. So that's one of the reasons I I came here this weekend was to find professional, caring growers to grow indigenous seed and save it. And it's not just save it like we save seed, but but save its existence. Um. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Here is Nate Kleinman, my twin brother from another mother. <laughs> <laughs> we were playing pool and some guys thought we were twins. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, so my name's Nate, uh, Nate Kleinman. I grew up in, um, outside of Philadelphia. I was like gardening, um, and uh, but I, you know, I'm I am many many generations removed from any kind of familial connection to agriculture. Uh, my family is all Jewish. We my people were not allowed to own land back in the old country, the, the various old countries that I, I come from. Um, although I did learn recently that I have a, 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 my great grandfather was a, a miller, was involved with milling grain and a baker, but. So I got into I got into farming and seed saving um, through a very roundabout way. I was involved in politics and uh, organizing. I worked for a union and had a bunch of different jobs. Um, but I was doing uh, hurricane relief work, and I think there's only one of you who was in my talk earlier today. But uh, so you get to hear this again, um, maybe a couple. So I. Uh, um, after Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey, I was living in Philadelphia at the time, and um, I had friends who were who I met through Occupy Wall Street, who were involved in New York, and they got mobilized. They mobilized themselves very quickly to go to some of the most marginalized communities in New York City uh, to help out immediately after the storm. And very quickly, they they created this massive organization uh, that was mobilizing tens of thousands of volunteers supplies were being shipped in from around the country and being you know shipped to occupy Sandy and not to the Red Cross and Salvation Army because they you know they have their set way to do things and they were thoroughly unprepared for a hurricane to hit New York City um, and uh, so friends called me in Philadelphia and we mobilized for New Jersey and started having nightly conference calls and just organized our butts off for the next two years to, to help out there. And uh, I quit the job that I had at the time, um, working for a union and just focused on that full time. Eventually, through donations, we were able to support ourselves and poverty wages. And we started doing some community gardening projects about a year or two into it. And, um, and I was reminded how, how much I, I love that work. Um, and then it occurred to me that I could spend the rest of my life bouncing from disaster to disaster because we have no shortage of disasters in this this changing world, um, or I could try and do something to get to the bottom of it and to deal with the overarching issue of climate change 
and my solution was to create this open source network for uh, breeding perennial plants essentially. That was, the, that was the main purpose when I, I uh, conceived of the experimental farm network. So the, the website now exists as, a, as an open source platform for anybody to put a project up. Anything that has to do with sustainable agriculture is, is fair game. We, will, we haven't had a problem yet, but if somebody wants to you know, put a, some GMO project up there, we will not let them um, because we're, we're firmly opposed to that. But um, So I, I'd been interested in seeds for a while, and I'd, I'd done some gardening and started hoarding seeds, um, <laughs> growing them in my little postage stamp backyard. Um, and then I, somebody introduced me to the USDA uh, website and uh, I discovered that our government has hundreds of thousands of accessions they call them hundreds of thousands of different varieties that they've collected from around the world for over a century and uh, they belong to all of us really they belong to the whole world uh, and we are uh, we are entitled to request little samples of them from the government and they send it to us for free um, so I have a little bit in this, we did a quick slideshow. But I, I just kind of started to realize that there's so much out there and we've got to preserve it. So I, I started just getting so many seeds and then having this network became really critical because there's no way one person can grow all the seeds they want to as a seed saver. There's, a, there's every individual species and even if sometimes within species, different types have different seed saving requirements. Um, you know, tomatoes are largely self-pollinating, so they are, it's pretty easy to save tomato seeds compared to others. You can grow them 10 or 20 feet apart and they're not likely to cross. Of course, there are exceptions to that rule. The potato leaf varieties and the current tomatoes are much more susceptible to crossing, so they need further isolation. And then something like squash, you gotta know that Bees are pollinating the squash, and the bees can fly five miles a day. So to be safe, you want your squash plants half a mile apart. And most people don't have, you know, miles wide farms to work with. So uh, you need to engage other people in it if you want to if you want to be a seed saver and, and do it on a, on a large scale. And I think all of us, you know, got uh, got bigger than our britches, our collections <laughs> did, and, uh, and so we started relying on others. And, and um, um, yeah, so I, I, I did prepare this, uh, that, that, that's, that's my me intro, but now I'll do this, uh, we prepared a few slides um, just to kind of put this all in, in perspective. Uh, the issue of monoculture is something that we, that, that we're, you know, the, the opposite of. This is what so much of American farmland looks like these days. Genetically modified corn or soybeans. No weeds. Wheat, yeah, no weeds, no hardly even any, any buffers, uh, hedgerows. Uh, these are sugar beets. You, often when you see sugar in something, <laughs> you assume it comes from sugar cane. But a huge amount of our sugar these days comes from GMO sugar beets. Uh, it's a massive industry, especially in, in parts of the West. Uh, canola, beautiful flower, also a genetically modified scourge on the landscape. Um, and it, it perpetuates this myth of abundance, this, this, this myth of diversity. When you go to the supermarket, you see all these different colors, but it's all the same, same foods, and it's these four or five crops. Um, so agrobiodiversity is the opposite of, of all that, and that's the that's the food. Uh, that's all agri all diversity related to agriculture. We're mainly focused on plants, but it does apply to animal biodiversity and uh, fungal and even microbial. Uh, so this is just a, a simple chart that shows the the um, the uh, loss of so many of these different varieties. Um, somebody looked through a bunch of different commercial seed catalogs in 1903 in this country and found 497 different lettuces. And then in 1983, it was down to 36 of those varieties could still be found in, in the National Seed Storage Laboratory. 
So we've just lost so much, and this is just the tip of the iceberg and a, and a small sample of what's been lost through the years. Um, but the, yeah, the story I told earlier today and that most people know about biodiversity that, that's kind of the, uh, that's the, the warning story is uh, about this potato, which the is lumper. the Irish lumper, uh, which was the main potato grown in Ireland in, uh, before the potato famine. It's still around, still susceptible to the same blight, but you can find it and grow it if you're interested. Uh, these, this is the diversity that you might find in a market in Peru of potatoes. And then this again is the lumper. So it's a very simple concept, but when you have when you have a diverse population, if a blight hits and you have one that's susceptible to it, it's going to kill that one. But you're still going to have some left. If you only have one and it's susceptible, they're all going to die. So that's sort of the basic, fundamental reason why preserving uh, biodiversity is important. And uh, with potatoes, you can continue to create biodiversity. You can plant a potato seed from a potato berry and get a new plant. They look like this, they're very cute, they look like a little baby potato plant, and that's exactly what it is. Um, these are a couple that I grew from seed. So that's, uh, we got a few more pretty pictures, but I'll leave that for now. We were gonna each, the plan was for each of us to talk about just a couple of seed stories, a couple of our, our favorite heirlooms that, that are meaningful to us and that have good stories attached to them. And, um, and then we want to open it up and, and Can I say talk more. About yeah. That specifically. Uh, just talking about true potato seed, if anybody is interested in that, there is a group online, um, Kenosha Potato Project, KPP. Um, and potatoes on, are kind on of. On Facebook. On Facebook, I'm sorry. Yeah, on Facebook. You can find it on Facebook. Uh, um, Curzio Caravati. Uh, and like, there's, there's a few guys, um, another Nathan. Uh, Pierce is super into it. But anyway, it's really interesting because, um, you know, potatoes are, you know, clonal reproduction generally is what we're doing when we're planting a piece of seed potato. It's just a clonal reproduction. And uh, they can accumulate virus loads pretty quickly. That's why they're always going back. Um, you know, you buy certified disease-free seed that's been uh, cultured out what, a couple generations back in the lab and then regrown out. Because they pick up virus loads from the soil really fast and they're so inbred. Well, they're clonals, not in breads, but like clonals. So they're, they're somewhat fragile. Um, but anyway, you can, some varieties still are fertile and will have berries. Um, you'll see some never produce berries. They're, they've already lost that genetic knowledge. Um, but other ones do produce. And have you noticed the little green berries in certain, when you have a good weather situation? Um, and you can collect those. And they're interesting because some of them are like tetraploids and stuff. and you just get this wild random genetic shuffle that just is insane. Like you can't even wrap your head around how many new things are in there. Um, and potato seeds are really super small. They're like small, they're like, they look like tomato seeds, but smaller. And um, yeah, so what these people do is they um, are growing out, on, you know, you don't know. It, it takes a little bit of dedication and adventure, sense of adventure to uh, go to, because you may get something that's totally like, eh, whatever. Um, but then you can find some really cool little special ones, and that's where you know some of our new varieties will you know can come from. And these two came from the same seed, same same berry same, probably. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and so anyway, you, you, anyway potatoes are cool because the the crazy genetic shuffle that can occur when you're breeding them. Yeah, you um, can't see the color, but the, that's like beautiful pink shading on this, and this is yeah, it's a little better on the computer, but kind of gets washed out on the bigger screen. Yeah. But um, anyway, sense of adventure, yeah, they're cute. So anyway. Do you want to talk some seed story? Seed stories. Um, yeah, do any of you, first before we get like distracted with our stories, do any of you want to chip in anything that you want to talk about specifically? Um, the question is, you know, what's my personal experience about uh, sharing, you know, knowledge that you may have about like genetically modified foods with the general public? Um, I can split it into different, different, you know, for every every time it's yeah, you know, can be a different story. In general, um, like I said, I've been a market gardener for almost thirty years, and so I tend to attract a uh, customer base that um, is more interested and slightly more aware and more concerned. 
but then I don't have to look any further than my own mother, <laughs> you know, who's just like, whatever. You know, um, my mother and my sister just absolutely do not care. And they think it's going to save the world, GMOs are great, you know. How, well, how else are we going to feed the world? You know, small farms can't do it. And I'm like, guess what? Most of the food produced in the world is produced on small farms. You know, when you go on a global perspective, I mean, America has some big farms, but globally, small farmers are feeding the world. Um, and most of the promises held out by genetic engineered foods, you know, you don't have to look any further than the golden rice fiasco. I mean, you cannot physically eat enough golden rice to change, you know, anything. You know, it's just, um, you know, just fiasco after fiasco. I mean, and forget about, you know, if you start talking about now with the corn, with uh, double engineered corn. And I personally had an issue and a... Uh, Debate. I run the farmer's market that I participate in. I'm also the market manager, dictator for life. Um, and I had one of my vendors selling double engineered corn. So if it, I'm sure I'll just, maybe not all of you know, but I'm sure you do, um, BT and Roundup Ready corn. Um, so you're dealing with, like for the army worms and stuff, which basically uh, BT, once it's um, you know, being expressed in the pollen and you get your pollen drift, what's one of the most common weeds along cornfields is your milkweed. Pollen drift is landing on the milkweed, uh, the monarch caterpillars are ingesting it and failing to pupate, and you know, it contributed to the decline of the monarch caterpillar population. Um, monarchs are making a bit of a comeback now. This year was actually the best year that I've seen in a while, but um, more awareness of it. Um, but anyway, I had an argument with the vendor about he, he had double engineered corn at the market, and he was very proud of it. And as a farmer, I understand his like love of his field. He looked out, and there was no worms in his corn, and there was no weeds in his field. And to a farmer, that's kind of like nirvana, you know? That's like great. But, you know, he's not looking at the deeper picture of the loss of life in his field you know, and the damage he's doing. And as a market manager, especially one being organic like myself, you know, I, I firmly believe that people at a farmer's market do not expect to buy genetically engineered foods. You know, and I didn't feel it was appropriate, didn't have a place in it, and he flat out said to me, and he was absolutely correct, he's like, you can't do anything about it until they pass laws to label, you know? And he's correct, I can't do anything about it, so we should all <laughs> be, you know, demanding labeling laws. And then he would have to like, you know, put labels on. I also find when I do talk about genetic uh, GMO stuff with people, uh, consumers, they're very woefully uninformed. They have this, uh, you know, like my local Agway will put out signs, GMO free seeds, you know, well, yeah, any retail, you know, any of the big box stores, they are all GMO free seeds because the average consumer can't buy GMO seeds. Yeah. And, but they use it as a marketing gimmick, you know, to pronounce it GMO free and stuff. And the average gardener doesn't really understand, you know. There, there's, it's, you know, even if they are, you know, you know, pa you know, a passionate gardener, they don't quite understand. Like they're, they're worried, like, oh, well, I don't want to buy GMO seeds. Well, guess what? You can't. You know, you have to be a bigger grower. And there's certain crops they think, oh. GMO lettuce, I'm like, no, there's, there's no GMO lettuce, you know, but you do have to worry about the sugar you're putting in your coffee, that's all GMO sugar beets, you know, there, there's just a disconnect and um, a lack of knowledge out there, I find, in general, in my, in my community, I live in a fairly rural, uh, upstate New York, although we are near a university, and the younger people are more aware, my mom flat out doesn't care, my sister doesn't care, Roundup Ready is, you know, quick breakdown, you could, yeah, 24 hours later, you're good to go, no, it's just you know, so there's a lot of misinformation out there, and uh, the um, the information is there, but there's yeah, but they glaze, people glaze over and they 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 skip cognitive Yeah, they glaze over. They don't read the information. Yeah, if there's an article in the newspaper, they don't read it. They they skip it. Yeah. No, you know what? He never lied. He never lied. If you asked him, right. he, he would tell you. Right. He, so he would never so, lie. So but it's a, it's, a, teach it's a town run market. Yeah. In. It's a town run market, and there is, it's a farmer's market. There is no, no place and no way that it, you can say organic vendors only accept it unless you go set up. You're free to go set up your own farmer's market. But as a town sponsored market open to all farmers, you can't discriminate. You want to do your seed seed story oh, now? Seed story, sorry. 
Uh, yeah, good side try. I don't. I didn't bring ears of my. Um, okay, I'm going to do Katie Wheeler. You yes, decided. I'm okay, Katie Wheeler. so I, I do you picture. have a picture? Uh, we're going to go back and forth. Uh, wait, go to my bean first. We'll do the bean first. <laughs> uh, Again, and it's hard to in. see the color in that, but you can see it on the screen here. Um, so that's my uh, blue bean that I've been working on, uh, selecting and refining, and uh, my my special project. Some of you may have picked it up. I had it. I was giving it away at the seed swap. Uh, I named it Sacra Blue, and uh, it's just one of those cool things that popped out. Is a, uh, you know, so one thing that we do as seed savers and breeders. I mean, no matter uh, what you think that you're saving something pure in the state that you're given, that's absolutely not true. Every time you save a seed, you're putting selection pressure. You're changing. You know, you unconsciously are. You know selecting for certain qualities and characteristics. Um, one thing as a seed saver you should be doing is like ro you know, roguing out things that aren't characteristic true to type that don't, you know, if you're trying to go for purity. Um, but sometimes you also find random things that pop up that are really cool and you're like, hey, I want to work with this. So you have an opportunity to uh, develop something on your own. So I had a dwarf blue bean that was sent to me from Germany. It's about 18 inches high, and it was a it was a pretty blue bean, but it had a black in the, a lot of black in the population, so a certain say, uh, you know percentage say you know maybe 10 percent, 15 percent of the beans were black. Um, but I was like, hey, this is a cool bean, and then uh, I noticed one of the plants had some like a semi runner tendency, and so it will have like a little bit of long tendrils and everything, and. Uh, so I was like, hey, that one looks cool. So I, I took all the beans off that one and grew them out separately. And over the last, you know, bunch of years, I've been selecting, you know, and um, now I'm up to a seven, I wanted a blue pole bean because I am now 52 years old and my knees hurt sometimes. And I pick, I pick bush beans for the farmer's market. I'm sick of crawling picking beans. Um, so I wanted a tall pole bean. Uh, so I started working with it to, now it's a pretty uniform seven foot pole bean and it's bright blue and I, I'm, pretty, I'm getting pretty good at getting rid of the blacks. I do have a cross that pops up now that it has a bit of a white clouded pattern, um, but it's like probably 1%, 2% maybe tops. Maybe that'll be a new variety. And maybe that'll be, if somebody else likes that, they can work with that. Um, it takes about you know seven years or so in general to stabilize something. Um, Anyway, so yeah, soccer blue. So it's kind of fun. Seed saving can be a fun adventure, you know, and you can like do your own thing and like, hey, I really like this. And that's one thing that I really love about seeds is, you know, it's holding, you know, human history in your hand. And with all the diversity, and I mean, I think most of you came through the seed swap at least and saw like all the beans, you know, that I had spread out everywhere. Each one, somebody at some point in history decided we're dealing with, you know, 10,000 plus years of agriculture and human history, somebody at some point said, hey, I like this one. I'm going to save this one, make sure this one gets planted. You know, um, whether it be uh, pr very productive, disease resistant, colorful, fact is I like the color and flash ones. I like the pretty colors. Um, you know, but... It's got to taste good too. It's got to taste good too. Um, you know, so, yeah, so obviously, yeah, so flavor. I mean, that's one thing, that is one thing that growing your own food, it's like the crap in the grocery store is just like, you know, and here's a sad story, and I'm, this is one of my rabbit holes. Here's a sad story. <laughs> this year, we grow a lot of strawberries for market. My daughter had a friend uh, that, she was picking up my daughter, comes down to the field, and it was strawberry season, and I said, hey, Michaela, you know, uh, grab some, you can pick a couple, we're picking strawberries, grab some strawberries, you know, and she bends over, she picks them, she eats it, and she's like, if you didn't tell me this was a strawberry, I wouldn't know it was a strawberry. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because to me, you know, and she's like, well, it tastes like fake to me. It's just too intense. It's like too much flavor, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, you know, and I, and so we get talking, and she's used to the grocery store strawberries, you know, or ones that you know, that have no flavor. And to her, a real strawberry was too much. And I'm like, <laughs> that is how sad state of affairs we've. And my daughter, who's now 20, she said, "Oh, mom, she's like, you should forget about growing all these tomatoes. Tomatoes have no future." And I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, she. 
out of all of her friends, and she goes to school up at, you know, she's at Cornell University, she's like, I don't know anybody else that likes a fresh tomato. She loves them, you know, because she grew up with real food. She's like, I don't know anybody that will eat a tomato. Yeah, she's like, they might eat it on something, but they would not go actively buy a tomato to eat. And I'm like, and I realize there's a whole generation that does not know what a real tomato tastes like. Why you think it's so hard to get your children to eat the Right, tomatoes. because they taste, you know, it's all about flavor. So anyway, I got sidetracked, so rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, uh, the other, I talked about my blue beans. So the other one, um, so here's the Katie Wheeler corn, which... Uh, like I said, I do grow outs for people, including Nate. And Nate, I, I had said to I had done a couple things for him already, and he knew, I had said to him, I'd like to grow things that have any connection to New York State, you know, especially upstate New York, um, which is where I'm from. And uh, so he sent me this corn. He got a, a grin, the, the germplasm, you know, the seed bank. And uh, it's a Haudenosaunee corn. It's small, it's a small plant, maybe four and a half, five feet tall. Um, Let's has, tell them who that is, Haudenosaunee. Oh, Haudenosaunee is uh, the Iroquois nation, um, group of the six nations, it was five, and then Tuscarora joins us six. Um, so yeah, the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee is their name for themselves, uh, not Iroquois, that was French given. Um, anyway, uh, so the, it's a Haudenosaunee corn, so I grew it. And I put a picture on my Facebook page. Um, and I was concerned because some of my ears, uh, I had gotten pink, white, purple from Nate. When I planted it, I got back some yellow kernels in the corn. And I was concerned that it had crossed because I do other corns. Um, and it seemed like a really early corn. And I didn't see it tasseling at the same time as the others. It was way before the others. It was the first to tassel. So I, yeah, but yeah, I'm like, well, if there's a thunderstorm, pollen could have blown in. I'm not really near any corn, and I'm kind of geographically pretty blocked. I have forest on three sides of our farm. But, you know, I was concerned. I had yellow kernels. A few. Not a lot, but a few. And uh, anyway, I put a picture on my Facebook page, and this man contacted me, Stephen McCumber, and it's led to quite the friendship. So he's the Mohawk man. And uh, he is one of the Haudenosaunee elders involved with uh, Haudenosaunee seed keepers. And he, he said, I am the person who collected the original you know, sample of Katie Wheeler corn. From and Katie Wheeler. From Katie Wheeler herself, who is still alive. I'm sure she's passed now. At that point when I grew it, she was like in her 90s in a nursing home on the Cattaraugus Reservation. And he had grown it for a few years, given out samples to other people, but nobody really picked it up and kept the seed, and he hadn't had fresh seed in quite a few years, and he didn't know anyone who's growing it um, at that point. And so he said, can I have a couple ears so I can take it back? And I was like, absolutely. I mean, it was just like chills. You know, I got to return the seed to him, and you know, it meant a lot to him. So anyway, we've become friends since and you know, hang out together. And he's yellow, great. The yellow kernels. Oh, the yellow kernels. So it turns out, Stephen said, oh, I see you have some yellow kernels. And I said, yeah, you know, I don't know if it crossed, you know. He's like, no. He's like, the original had some yellow kernels, and he didn't think they had belonged, and he picked out all the yellow kernels. <laughs> and, but they actually, genetically, they are supposed to be there, and they had popped back up in my sample, even though I'd only planted pink, white, purple. So that gene expression was still, it was hidden and it still popped up. Yeah, I was just going to say, to put it in context, so this is a photo we found online. Somebody else grew this Katie Wheeler corn, and it doesn't have any, any yellow. So Stevens is still circulating out there. Some people have it, but it doesn't have the yellow kernel. But apparently it, it was early enough given to the USDA gene bank when it still had the yellow genes, and so that's what, that's what uh, Lisa was able to grow. So. Oh, no, they're no, all the same. They're all the same. Um, the the yeah. diversity that exists in that population is expressed in, uh, in those three different ways. Like you can see, like these, this is one, this is one variety of corn, but every year is unique. And that's what you, happens well, when you have diverse, you, this, pop, this, diverse this yeah, is the populations. Better, so this, I mean, Chris, you want to do this one? This is the Murado corn. Which is a Peruvian purple, like black purple. It's used in a drink, and um, also people can die with it and stuff. 
Yeah. All right. This isn't my story, but I'll go ahead and tell this too. It's your turn anyway. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so this is maize burrado. This is uh, Peruvian corn. And it is, just, as you can see, it's just black as night. They use it for dye, and it's used to make coochie. It's, uh, uh, there's several names for the drink, but um, it's a beautiful, got purple husks. Very, very beautiful flower corn. And uh, it's about, well, I mean, it's been growing for at least 2,000 years. And um, so I've, I've been growing it for probably close to 20 years. And uh, it's always, see, here's a real, real black one. It's always black. It always has been ever since anybody could ever remember it's been black and it's also been the same um, look which is just and I'll pass this around if you guys want to look at it it's uh, like a flower corn you'll see it's dented it's kind of yep. it's similar to that well this year I planted it and amongst all the maize morado corn I thought somebody was tricking me. I thought it was a, a joke. I started opening these beautiful purple husks, and all of a sudden, I see these big white ears of corn, red ears of corn, orange ears of corn, pink and white ears of corn, spotted ears of corn. Now, it's it's not crossed because you, you can tell if uh, corn is crossed it wouldn't, wouldn't be solid colors like this but what's even more amazing by is these are different types of corn this is not the same type of corn this is like kind of like if you planted a tomato and got a grape out of it <laughs> in, in, in essence I mean it's kind of like that this is a, a gourd seed which is uh, indigenous people call tooth, tooth corn. They look like teeth. Um, but I'll pass a couple of these around. You guys can look. Um, and there's, there was one that it had uh, 12 different types of corn. I counted 12 separate types. Not colors, there was more colors. Is that on one stalk? Or? No. Uh, there, was a, there was a couple that had two stalk and it was, they were similar. And a lot of those were like this. You see how that is deep burgundy? That's like almost the mix of the two. So those with the two stalks, most of them were like this. Um, but there was one corn, one or two, that had these um, deep, dark colors, but they, they were almost scale-like. And I've, I've seen that before in, in some of the older uh, corns in Peru. Well, come to find out, I talked to a geneticist, and I've talked to Mark Cohen, I've talked to all kinds of people, and um, what uh, would you like to tell them, Mark, what, what you think has happened? Well, I'm, I was kind of befuddled, to say the least, but talking to Reginaldo, who's got a long indigenous history, uh, it, it kind of leads to a question I have about strategy and the loss of 94% of a lot of these crops. I think this is strategy. I think these older varieties could find uh, each crop's equivalent of this because deep embedded in, in this genetics is, I think, a tremendous uh, Fort Knox of, of genes. The thing that we don't know about 90, losing 90, 94% of all of our food crops you know, by USDA standards alone, 1804 to 1904, there were over 90% loss of every crop. Those are varieties that doesn't tell us how many genes were lost. 
what's happening in here is that there are genes embedded so deeply, going back thousands of years, that they can express um, you know, possibly everything we've ever seen and more. Um, so it's the genes that I think we really need to conserve here. Uh, varieties can be reselected. So I, to tell you genetically what happened, I don't think I can, other than that, that it's like uh, you know, it's reaching like, into a, you know, a, a hat and pulling out a rabbit. But um, I'm going to talk to some people I know about it and see if I can get a better understanding so that I can share that with you. But uh, I think it's, it's very interesting. I, I started looking at some of the rainbow corns. And uh, who's the man with the, in the uh, seed savers exchanging between the corns? The Carl Jackie? Barnes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was sure. I was actually starting to understand the key instead of just by looking at this spirit of rainbow, rainbow corn, and he his hand came around my shoulder and started pointing out each kernel and giving me names of Navajo and Zuni and Hopi varieties and all different types of corn in that. And that's when I started realizing that if you save that corn, you've got more. You're saving more than all of the corn you see driving from here to Colorado. Uh, so we kind of have to develop a set of genetic classes. This is one of Carl Barnes. Oh, it's just a while I have one okay. and two. All right. So this All right. is from a Carl Barnes collection. This is a Cherokee wampum uh, I got from an Onondaga man, um, which I give some to Chris, too. Uh, but anyway, this is one of Carl Barnes' cool. collections. Is he still with us? No, he no. passed. He passed, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. And uh, I'm curious about other crops, if anything like this hap is happening in, in other crops. Not, not that I've, I've personally seen, no. Or even not this extreme, but, but just a lot of very, I mean, I can, I have, a, I have a quick one I can tell. Uh, I, I can do a quick, and I have a picture of it actually. I'll give it back in a sec. Um, so the, the first picture that I had up earlier is the, uh, this is the, oh, yeah. the Nanticoke squash. Okay. So I got these seeds from Seed Savers Exchange from their vault. Yeah, which are not ones that are publicly available. You have to be a member and request a small packet. They got it, the seeds from the Abundant Life Foundation, which, um, which was uh, the records of which were destroyed in a barn fire a couple decades ago. It's now the Organic Seed Alliance, uh, the Abundant Life Foundation. So anyway, we don't know exactly what the story is of this squash, but what I do know and it's, it's, again, the colors are all washed out up there, but um, you, can see the, you can see the diversity that exists in this population. The first time I grew it out, I grew out one plant, and I uh, had it in my backyard, and it produced fruit that looked just like this one. Half uh, pink on the sunny side and blue on the shady side, like baby blue, baby pink. Uh, beautiful colors. And um, I had two fruit from that, and I, I ate one, and I left the other one on my counter in my kitchen. I just want to see how long it would keep. And it lasted for 18 months. And I thought, okay, this is something special. I started giving out seeds um, to other people. And a friend of mine brought me some fruit back that she'd grown in her backyard. And I knew that I'd isolated it. It was, there was nobody else growing any, any Maxima squash anywhere nearby. And she brought me back this gray thing. And I said, oh, this is, this is pretty different, and a brown one. And, um, and I said, okay, this is kind of cool. And then when I moved on to a farm and had suddenly room to spread out and I planted 100 Nanticokes, I got this diversity popped out. And I gave it to other people who knew what they're doing and said, does this look like a normal kind of crossed up something? And they said, no, this is, this is, this is something different. And, um, you know, this... This population, the Nanticoke people live in southern New Jersey and uh, southern Delaware, eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, so they were at a center of global trade in the 1600s. Ships were going out the Chesapeake and the Delaware Bays um, and traveling around the world. Knowing that some of these are incredibly long keepers, I have no doubt that they were put on ships and they went around the world as food. Uh, and you can see what we now consider heirlooms from all over the rest of the world there's echoes of those things. This looks like the Turk's turban squash, which is actually a French heirloom. These blue ones look like uh, Queensland blue or some of these Australian heirlooms. Uh, the red one looks like a red curry squash from, from Japan. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, there's just, there's, there's so much in there. Now that I've grown this for a, a, about a decade, I know that this is, 
you know, these are all variations on a theme. It's not like every year you get something different. If it were a real, if it were an accidental cross, a mistake, there would be, you know, we'd see all kinds of, we'd see all kinds of different things. But these patterns, they're always the same patterns. Chris? Are there taste variations? Yeah, there's absolutely taste variations. Um, the red ones don't keep very long. The pink and gray ones keep, uh, and blue ones keep for a long time. The, the turban ones also don't keep very long, usually. My favorite ones are probably the, um, the grayer ones. They tend to have a thicker flesh. I love to make gnocchi with them and fry chunks of them. And this one here almost has, you can't really see it, but it's like this gray, and then there's these almost golden splotches on it. It's really beautiful, and that one was delicious. It hasn't come back since, but so hopefully it'll come back does again the interior soon. Interior coloring and flavor and all that varies. It all varies, but it's all pretty similar. I mean, it's pretty similar. Occasionally, you'll get a kind of insipid, watery one, like the like uh, some of these rounder, dull gray ones. But the blue gray ones are always delicious. And then uh, that was the coolest, coolest one visually that I ever saw. It's hard, yeah, hard to hard to see, but that's like this crazy beautiful blue x-men so, uh, it did taste good yeah all right i'll give this back to chris sorry and find the chink pin that i dropped uh i had brought a couple beans to talk about uh indigenous beans one of them uh kind of is close to me i was talking about my my grandfather earlier and um, it's, it's not my uh, American Indian grandfather, it's actually uh, my white grandfather. Um, he was a deacon and, uh, in the Methodist Church, a lifelong member. Um, he was in the uh, Methodist men's in the conference. He was all, uh, did all kinds of stuff like that. Well. Um, in the 18, uh, 1820s, running there, there was a uh, man named William Apis, and he was a Pequot Indian that uh, became a Methodist minister. Uh, he's known for his activism, for being um, active as in the American Indian community, helping them, etc. He supposedly uh, had beans in his family. We're not sure if it went through his actual family or tribe that he was with, not sure, but uh, it had came down through the Methodist Church and had been grown uh, since the 1830s. Well, my grandfather had uh, collected them in the 70s and had grown them out every year and they, they uh, call them the Mashpee Wampanoag Methodist beans because um, even though he was uh, quiet they believed they were Mashpee beans um, the other bean I brought is an indigenous bean it's called little sticks floating on top of water indigenous people are known for their very very long names of, of all, kind, all kinds of stuff, but especially beans. Um, this is a Potawatomi variety. Um, I got this in Kansas at a powwow. Um, the lady was in her 70s. Uh, her mother had passed about two months prior to that, and uh, it was kind of a, an emotional time for they had a uh, memorial service at this powwow and one of the things that they did was had a feast and this this bean uh, was one of the ones that they had cooked as they, they had grown the last they had and made a feast out of it for everybody well what was interesting about it was Nobody saved any of the beans except the daughter. They were all, all cooked. So literally there, there was just a handful 
of the beans left. The daughter passed. She was in her 70s, passed away. Her daughter contacted me. So back 18, um, I'm going to say 1840s. Well, the family name was Waboygan. Um, and in 1930s, the matriarch, and we're going to say she was, I'm thinking great, great, great grandmother. Um, they left and had moved from Kansas to Michigan. Um, the woman's name, the, the matriarch, was Blue Dance Blanket. And uh, she was a school teacher in the 30s. Um, her, the, the elderly lady that, uh, that I had known uh, said that when she was little, they called those beans little sticks floating on the water. And it was because the way they had preserved them was they had uh, dried them whole. Usually in Appalachia, we would break them and string them and hang them up, and we call them leather breeches. Later, we cook them, and uh, they're shuck beans, shucky beans, like that. Um, but this family had, uh, had preserved them whole. So when she would cook them in her cast iron, cast iron kittle, they would just float like sticks on top of a string. So that's what her great-grandmother had called them. And later after she passed, they called them school teacher beans, schoolhouse beans. So, but uh, these are just one of the endangered varieties that we have and we find them all over the place they come to us it's almost like they find us out <laughs> cool Great. yeah um, so I, I had two that I was going to talk about I'll try and be quick so we can get to some more discussion um, so this is a chinkapin chestnut and most of the most of the plants we've been dealing with are annuals and uh, a lot of the, you know, when you think about seed saving, typically people are talking about annuals, but perennial plants also require saving in many cases. Um, they're often clonally propagated. Things like apples are grown from cuttings, grafted to preserve an individual variety. Um, and the same is true of, of nut trees, uh, and there's all sorts of other perennial plants that, that reproduce vegetatively, clonally, and it's important to save those as well. Uh, but so this is a, this plant is called a chinkapin chestnut. Uh, it's also called an Allegheny uh, Allegheny chinkapin. Um, chinkapins are native to this country. They're native to the southeast. Uh, they grow as far north as Pennsylvania historically, uh, probably into New York as well. Uh, but the, the records are are pretty scant. When the chestnut blight came and uh, largely destroyed the American chestnut, it knocked back the chinkapin chestnut as well. Uh, it's a close relative, but chinkapins are smaller. The, the nuts are, are pretty small. They're born singly in a burr, while uh, American chestnuts and most Asian chestnuts are, are at least two or three to a burr. Um, and they're also distinguished by their flavor. They are sweeter. Uh, the texture is quite, quite nice, raw. You can eat, you wouldn't really want to eat most chestnuts raw, but these are quite delicious raw. Uh, you can candy them like other chestnuts. You can make flour from them, it makes a great flour. Uh, and back in the day, chinkapins would get 60 feet tall and underneath a big mature chinkapin tree in the fall, you'd find you know, three or four inches of nuts and burrs on the ground, and it was, you could harvest a bunch. They were, there's some old news articles, they were incredibly sought after in, uh, in the eastern markets. You know, the, the, the two weeks of the year when chinkapins were available, there was a rush on the markets to, to buy them up, and people, people would eat them for the next couple months at home. Um, but the blight prevents them now from reaching even a height of 30 feet. But they will still produce... They're, so they're susceptible to the blight, but they'll still produce for 10, 
20 years. Um, they'll grow 15 feet tall, they might die back to the ground, but the blight doesn't kill the roots and it sends up, sends up more, more tree. So uh, somebody told me about this plant in South Jersey after I moved there to farm. And they said that uh, when they were young, they would go up by Barry's Chapel and, uh, and hunt for cheeky pins. And I had never heard of a cheeky pin before. Um, and then I did some sleuthing and figured out, okay, this is probably a chinka pin. And um, Barry's Chapel, the place where he used to go as a kid, was long gone, had burned down. There's still a road called Barry's Chapel Road, though. So I went looking to see if I could still find some cheeky pins uh, out there by the old Barry's Chapel. And um, interestingly, the uh, Barry's Chapel was an African-American church in this rural South Jersey area. And the African-American community uh, had been there for a very long time. It was the first free black community in the U.S. is called Gould Town in that area from the 1600s. And, uh, but because they were kind of living on the margins of the, of the Anglo society, and so were the Lenape and Nanticoke people who had settled there. Um, they largely uh, fused as a, it's, a, it's a, like a tri-ethnic group. The um, Nanticoke Lenny Lenape is the name of the tribe down in South Jersey, uh, and the people there are descended from Africans, Lenny Lenape people, and Nanticoke people who were from the eastern shore of Maryland and, and southern Delaware, and eventually settled in New Jersey after they got displaced from, from Delaware. So anyway, that site, which history records an African-American church, was probably, uh, was probably an indigenous, uh, was probably near, near an indigenous settlement, and um, very likely these chinkapins that are still, can still be found there today were probably planted there by, uh, by some indigenous people because we're at the very, very northern part of the range. It's very likely that New Jersey did not naturally have any chinka pins growing there, but they were put there by, by native people. And it's a state endangered species. It can still be found some places. But then I found this guy in, Vir I, I was told about this guy in Virginia who had been obsessed with chinka pins. Uh, he was a patent lawyer in Richmond and he had he has a whole, had this whole plantation. He died in 2012, but a friend of mine heard about this property and said, you can go check it out. So a few falls ago, I went looking for, uh, for some, uh, for these chinka pins and um, I pretended I was looking to buy the property and uh, I actually was interested, but I didn't have the money. And, uh, and the realtor was like trying to show me the busted house that's falling apart and the airstream that's still parked there where this guy used to live when he was there. And, um, and I was like, just get, give me five minutes. I want to take a look at these trees. So I ran into the trees <laughs> and found, found that there were loads of chinkapins and striking diversity, including these big seeded ones. Uh, the one on the right is enormous compared to any other chinkapin I'd ever seen. Took a lot of sleuthing. Uh, the, I have a few of them in my hand. These are from a smaller uh, slightly smaller one, but they're still big for chicken fins. Um, I found out that this guy had been given cuttings from special trees down in Georgia that were believed to be a natural hybrid between either American chestnut and chinkapin or Chinese chestnut and chinkapin. Um, but they may be just big chinkapins. We have to do genetic testing and figure it out. Um, but there are, he grafted them, he hired a guy to graft them, and I Somebody gave me the number of that guy this, like a few months ago. I've got this guy on the phone who had done the grafting 40 years ago of these trees in Virginia for this guy who's now long gone. And um, he said that he got them from Georgia. He told me roughly where and uh, that, that he believed that they were across, but he's not, he's not really sure. Um, and most of the grafts, unfortunately, because the blight, as I said, the blight will knock down these plants, and then they come back from the roots. Most of the plants in that whole planting are coming back from the root, and he rooted them on, on native root stock from the local Virginia chinka pins. Um, so most of them make very tiny nuts uh, that aren't, very, aren't particularly useful, but I found four or five <coughs> trees that are, that are, the graft survives, 
they're still making really beautiful nuts, including these these four that are in my pocket. Um, so that's one that's really exciting. Um, there's also a population of, uh, actually from the Nanticoke people, the, the same people from that squash, who had these, um, who had a big, this guy had this big plantation down in Southern Delaware. He didn't know that the trees still existed, but they were like low growing ones on the ground, just little things and an arborist said, hey, you know, those are chinkapins. And if you cut out the canopy in your woods, you cut out those pine trees, they'll grow back. So he cut those pine trees down and within seven years, he had these 15 foot tall trees loaded with nuts that are bigger than the average ones. And he's pretty certain that because this was a historical site, it was the site of the Kaskarawak community, which was where, um, which was uh, John Smith found, like encountered this village on the, his notorious uh, trip when, when he met Pocahontas. Um, and uh, they're still there. Those trees are still there. They were, the bases of them are huge. So they were probably 100 year old trees or hundreds of years old when the blight knocked them back. And, um, and yeah, they're still quite amazing. So that's, um, that's a pretty amazing thing. And then this last story is, uh, Lisa grew this. One of the first things Lisa grew for me uh, is this coral sorghum that comes from a town in South Sudan where I have a friend from. And I, I did a search for the, this town name in the USDA database and found that, that, that they have a couple of sorghums from Malakal, South Sudan, nine sorghums. I grew, asked for all of them, tried to grow them all out. Four of them did very well, and this was the most beautiful and the most successful one, so I tried to spread it around, get a lot of people growing it. Um, it's, the, it's the purple one here in this picture. Um, but there's so much diversity in sorghums, this brown one, the white ones, this is a perennial experimental one popping sorghum from India here, another one from Darfur, Sudan here. And um, so yeah, sorghum can be popped like popcorn, you can turn it into a grain, the stalk can be pressed, and uh, that sweet juice can be boiled down into molasses. It's just a, a fantastic crop, and uh, you know, that one, that, that city, Malakal, this town in South Sudan, uh, was, the, was the center of the Shuluk people's culture. And um, Sudan has got lots of different tribes. It's a country that's been riven by war for the last half century. And the Shuluk people in the, most, in the recent civil war that's really still ongoing in South Sudan, um, the, the Shuluk people were uh, expelled from Malakal. So the people who developed this sorghum in this town are no longer there. And uh, so it's, you know, the fact that we can preserve this here um, and potentially give it back to them if they're ever able to go back to their land, um, you know, is some that that's part of the the power of seeds and the, the significance um, of the work that that we're doing. And uh, yeah, that's that's my story. Um, we did, I did, we did put this in the slide just to show you, we keep mentioning it, the National Plant Germplasm System, NPGS. These are all of the sites around the country where there's a repository. Um, Ames, Iowa has a lot of the grains. Um, Pullman, Washington has a lot of the legumes. Corvallis has a lot of clonal stuff like strawberries and hops and chestnuts. Uh, Miami has the uh, cacao and the coffee and some other tropical stuff. Um, Geneva, New York has the apple collection, among other things, cherries. And uh, the site's really easy. You can go to this <laughs> website, you just search for NPGS, it'll come up. This is GRIN, the Germplasm Resources Information Network, or now they call it GRIN Global, because they're collaborating with folks around the world. You type a, code, a word in there, I typed Massachusetts, <coughs> And I got 597 things came up that have some connection to Massachusetts. And um, yeah, this is, this is a really powerful tool. Again, anybody who has a legitimate research, breeding, or educational purpose has access to these seeds and the government will send it to you. You click on one of these, you open the thing, and then eventually you, you say, yeah, I can actually open this and show you. Actually, it's 
I don't know why it does this, but uh, yeah, you can you can basically create a shopping cart like on Amazon, and uh, it will, um, and it will. Uh, I don't know what happened here. Yep. All right. Well, oh, there it's it back there. Um, you can you just have to be a pretty good BSer and explain that you want to use this for breeding your small scale breeder or you're involved in an educational project or something and they don't ask too many questions they might push back a little bit but you just explain you know I want something that is not commercially available and this is why I need what I need and um, and they should send it to you and fix this Here. any questions about anything um, I was wondering about Wait, wait, wait. I was wondering about the Irish potato example, um, how it's still sort of susceptible to a lot of diseases, um, and obviously caused a great famine quite a while ago. Um, are there ever any seeds that you determine are no longer worth trying to keep, uh, and how would you determine that? Like, when's, do you have a limit, um, or no? I mean, in my opinion, I would never make that determination that something isn't worth keeping, everything. It, it's like having a jigsaw puzzle and you deliberately throw out a piece and it's like, well damn, you're gonna need that soon, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> you get to the end of the puzzle and you're missing that piece. Uh, so yeah, I, it, that would not be up to, like basically I think we are in agreement that we are all just temporary caretakers and uh, you know, yeah, we would, I don't think any of us would ever you know, there's certain things I decide aren't worth for me to grow. And I guess, you know, maybe that's my question. How do you decide but, if it's worth Okay, it? perfect example. Like, uh, for a couple of years, I was trying to grow this Isleta Pueblo blue corn. And it was a, you know, southwest corn. Beautiful. First year, we actually had a, pretty much a drought year. And I had huge, like, 14-inch cobs on it. Gorgeous, dark blue. Grew great. And I was all excited about it and everything. Well, ever since then... Well, I don't grow it anymore, but uh, then I had more typical upstate New York weather with uh, a lot more moisture <laughs> and super susceptible to fusarium. Not worth my time growing, you know. There are times that you just realize that, you know, some things are geographically appropriate and, yeah, some things are kind of fun to kind of push the envelope a bit. Nate does that a lot and stuff, but at the same time, you're time here is finite and your space and time and energy are finite, you know. There's so much to grow that I do pass along what's not appropriate for me or my region or, um, but you know, that said, I love like, like I, I've been, I've played around with uh, daylink sensitive beans in the past. I haven't the last couple of years because they're time intensive. A lot of, um, so a lot of your central yeah, you know, in South American, like equatorial region beans are daily sensitive, and a lot of people up here that don't really think about it, they're like, oh, just give them more light. And I'm like, mm, no, backwards. You actually have to provide more dark. Um, we're the long day situation up here. Uh, so they start blossoming. Yeah, you know, we'll start setting for blossoms at our equinox, our fall equinox. So September around to September 21st, they start budding to bloom. That's their trigger. And so you have to provide blackout cages if you want to fake them out. And, you know, it's kind of fun to say you did it once or twice, you know, but it, on the flip side, it gets, I'm busy. Old. It gets <laughs> old real fast, you know. But it depends on how adventurous you are. But anyway, I, yeah, that's my opinion. I don't know if either of you have any more, you know, like, yeah, definitely we, we I think all of us pass along stuff to people who, you know, you know, take a shine to something else and, that frees you up to find something that you're really into, too. Well, I, I guess I probably collect about everything. <laughs> anything and everything. Um, and there's a lot of it that I don't care for. And don't. <laughs> if I can don't get ask away, him to grow turnips. I hate a turnip. <laughs> Rutabaga. Mm, cabbage. Forget it. I can't stand this. I hate them. Uh, if I can get past growing them, I will. I, I, I may grow them once, a big lot of seed, 
and be done with it. Just keep that as long as I can. Um, so I I try to have a, a great diversity in what I grow. I, I mean, we have everything from uh, banana and coffee to beans and corn and your daily staple type foods all the way to all kinds of greens to what else? I mean, just cotton. Cotton. About everything, don't we? Oh, yeah. So, I... I don't. Uh, I don't really pass up anything as far as collecting. I kind of feel it all needs to be saved. I feel a little guilty not saving it. <laughs> so, yeah. And I drop anything that doesn't grow well. For me, I won't grow again. I might try it twice if it's something with a really cool story. And yeah. We got limited time, limited space, so I, I do feel like I have to drop stuff off. If I can give it to somebody, I'll try, but I try not to feel too guilty about it because there's just too much. Yeah, I try to. We have um, we have a, a huge grow list every year, so we have, we have a big turnover that we have to do. So sometimes uh, with mine, it'll be 200, 250 tomatoes. Um, it may be a hundred corn, you know, 150, just depends, maybe, maybe just 50, um, depending on the year. Um, just 50. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Because we're, you know, running out of time here a bit. But. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> the variety of that. Morado? Maize Morado? Yeah. Maize Morado. Maize. Oh, I'm terrible. <laughs> Maize Morado. Maize Morado. Um, so, my understanding is that, would you call that a land race? Or, I mean, I mean I originally, yeah, yeah, probably. That's very, very old. It's ancient. Variety. It is it's old. Ancient, right? Yeah. So, um, like Mark was saying, it. It would take some time, but could um, breed out these. Select out that again. <clears throat> Select out. Yeah. We're gonna. I'm gonna see. I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't expecting this. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I did. I didn't bring all the corn. I uh, actually my favorite one that I'm I'm really gonna be growing is a purple solid purple gourd seed. Which, in in my culture, is the purple is actually a a sacred color, so I am definitely going to be trying to to grow that. And just on that note, I'm going to I went to a seed swap with Chris down in was it Kentucky this past April? I go down every year or try to, and uh, he had a gray corn. And it was like this pearly, translucent gray with huge seed on it. And um, <coughs> I didn't take it when I was down in Kentucky. And then I kept thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. So I sent him a message. I'm like, hey, if I think about this much, I, sh I need to grow it. <laughs> you know. So he sent me some seed for that. So sometimes something just you know, resonates with you. It's just, it was very unusual, you know, beautiful, pearly gray. It, it looked like the cob actually looked like it was concrete. I had got it out of a field, a past friend of mine, and um, I'd say, what, the kernels are bigger than my thumbnail? Yeah, they're huge. Yeah. And they are stone, st my, what I see is this stone concrete gray. And I've never seen another, I've never it's seen really another corn that color it. ever. And I've, I've yeah, seen a lot, a lot of <laughs> varieties of corn and I have not a one other that same color. So I'm anxious to. I'm all about the color. To see what it's gonna look like <laughs> when she grows it. Because I, I, I know that when we trade seeds, I'll have a, like a purple Corona bean, and I'll have one grown from Illinois and I'll have another one grown from New York, and it's half the size. One of them's almost 
lavender is so light and the other one is dark and twice the size. <clears throat> so it's the same bean, it's just a matter of weather and, you know, soil. I think it's just the environment well, even, really does change color and, and size. Yeah, and I think gene expression is neat. I didn't bring it in as one of my examples, but I have a bean, Nona Agnes, which uh, is a blue bean in general. And so many people are so disappointed when they grow it because there's tons of browns and grays in it, and they think they reject them and everything. Totally normal. What they are is actually a temperature gradient, and it's basically a little recording of what your temperature was when those set. <laughs> and uh, the cooler temperatures, the bluer the bean. You know, the warmer temperatures, you've got your browns and grays. And honestly, to put them all together in a jar, it looks like a little ocean stones. You know, it's kind of got that watery look to it. And they belong together. And that's one thing that we have to realize, too, is that, um, you know, yeah, sometimes the, the mix is actually, yeah, like, the, you know, sometimes you want to play and select out one color and everything, but a lot of times the actual seed is supposed to be a color family or something like that. But I just thought the blue, this example with, you know, it's a clear temperature gradient. It's like a recording of, of, of that, which I thought was neat. I, you know, and also um, so different soils, different water, you know, moisture levels and stuff. Um, say a red and white bean, like the Jacobs cattle, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Grown in certain weather conditions, it'll be mostly red with splashes of white. But certain weather conditions, I've seen it tons of times, be mostly white with splashes of red. Um, there's tons of beans that we call reverses, where you grow them out and, you know, you, you'll get um, like Tuscarora red bean, I had uh, do this a lot the last time I grew it out, where it's supposed to be a dark maroon bean with hand, hand flucking on it. And uh, that year I had tons of reverses, which is just basically the opposite. It's a tan base with red flucking on it. Um, and those are reverses. You think you got two different beans or that you cross something, but no, there's, there's just reverses and you get some pretty cool. But if you plant them again, if I plant those tan ones with the red, the next generation I'm going to get back the, the more standard red with the tan. You know, it's just a reversal. And they, say, they think it's a lot to do with weather conditions. So, kind of cool. Oh, there, Chris. Um, what is a Grex? I can answer I that. I just like... So, uh, a Grex is a term that comes from orchid breeding, actually. Uh, orchids are, are very challenging to breed, and the seeds are almost minuscule they're like spores practically and um, so when you do a cross between a couple of orchids or multiple different orchids and you're you're just trying to cross them and create something new orchid breeders just always want something new something beautiful um, they would create they would end up with a wild mix of different orchids all growing from the same original same pot and they refer to that as a grex uh, in the last probably decade or so, the term has been taken on by uh, other plant breeders as well to describe a basically a wild mix, often multiple varieties crossed together. Uh, you might call it a synthetic land race. It's a, it's a diverse population um, that uh, has a lot of potential for breeding new things out of. I, I have the uh, um, perennial, uh, perennial kale Grex is something that we sell, and it's, um, I know it's in here somewhere. Um, also, if you're interested in Grex, and if you're interested in land race stuff, um, if you're on Facebook, look up Joseph Lofthouse and his work with land race stuff, and whoops, Joseph Lofthouse's work, and check him out. He's like the opposite of me. Like he said at the NOFA conference last year, I came with a thousand beans all in their own little jars, and he came with a thousand beans all in one jar. So what he does is he takes, he'll take, he, like he, last year he took all my fava beans, he mixed them all up and tossed them out there, and he he's a big, huge fan of being as like, a, you know, he, he's selling off all of his irrigation stuff. He's like, I'm not watering anything, I'm not weeding anything, uh, just conditions, what survives is, hey, great, what survives, you know, and uh, he does the promiscuous tomato project, he thinks, you well, know, he's, he's right, tomatoes have gotten so weak and dependent, and, uh, you know, basically they sell, um, usually, but whatever, so he's done the promiscuous tomato project, and he crosses and back breeds to wild tomato species, and he's trying to get super promiscuous tomatoes that cross all the time, and he's really into this wild genetic 
land race situation that he believes will contribute to resiliency when you're faced with like a climate crisis or something like that. So he's producing very elaborate gene pools. Um, nothing looks like the next, the one doesn't look like the one next to it, you know, it's not varietal, but it's a land race and it's really good at adapting, you know, he can send that population out and people can select for their own climate and, uh, you know, get a, you know, resiliency that way. Uh, loft house, L O F T H O U S E. And yeah, we um, my my project experimental farm network. We sell some of Joseph's seeds to get help get them out there. We're probably going to be selling a lot more of his because he doesn't like dealing with people, so he wants to start selling through <laughs> He's us, unique. which is which is great. Um, he wants you to send him a real silver coin when you order seeds from him. He doesn't, he doesn't like modern currency. He's, uh, he's a hilarious guy. But this is from a friend. He also makes his own Viking tunics that he wears and stuff. This is from our friend Chris Homanix, who's out in Oregon. And uh, it's hard to tell the differences on this with the colors here, but um, it's, uh, that's a, a Grex that was created for a perennial kale breeding project. So all of these things are just there's so I, much diversity I, I in that grew, population. Yeah, I grew it out. For and they're you all guys, different. And right? they were all different. I, yeah, yeah, I did. I did what, like maybe sixty plants. Every single one was different. Any of them still alive? No, they died in that winter. Yeah, rough yeah. winter. They did. They didn't make it. Perennial in Oregon. I've I've had some friends have had some grow in Detroit and had them survive a few Detroit winters, but. Upstate New York uh, apparently is rough. Well, we got we got like three feet of snow. Right. And uh, for all winter. They just no, just that one storm, but they just froze off to the ground and didn't mm -hmm. come back. And shucks, but yeah, you can get involved in this breeding project, and you can order seeds for this from our site and uh, play around and see what you get. Because every every with a Grex, every single seed is going to give you something completely different than the next. That's a true land race. Right. I mean, it, it's a synthetic land race, this oh, yeah. would be. Yeah, yeah, I guess from uh, what you were explaining, um, indigenous, indigenous people, that's um, what they do, that's what they used to do and still do, is just throw their seeds down a hill or something and see what survives, and then that keeps on going. Right. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's there's less, there was less of a need for, uh, they weren't thinking about standardizing colors, standardizing shapes, and it wasn't, they weren't growing for commercial use, they were growing for resilience, growing for food. So, yeah, it was more complicated than throwing it down a hill, but they would, you know, they would plant plant them all, and the ones that survived, the ones that did well, that's what you, that's what you save for next year. Yeah. I think it's time to wrap up, um, but yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all guys. so much. <laughs>